record. So in starting this journey in Regen Ag Local Farmer series, I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting. For me, it's the Jar Jar Rung people. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And welcome any, and acknowledge any uh, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who we may have joining us today or watching this recording later on. So today, um, this, this program is part, this webinar is part of the Healthy Landscapes Practical Regenerative Agricultural Communities Program with our um, supporters along the bottom there, Melbourne Water, Hepburn Shire, City of Greater Bendigo, Macedon Shire, Upper Colburn Catchment, um, Landcare Network, Colburn Water, North Central CMA, and a healthy Colburn catchment. Uh, shortly, I'll introduce Darren um, and the family that run, that run the property, his wife, Carissa. Um, and we'll hear a presentation for Darren for about 35 minutes, which we'll talk about the background for him being on the property, his current context and what he's currently doing and the future direction of his property. And then hopefully, we'll, if, uh, if I uh, do the right thing by chairing the meeting, um, we'll have about 10 or 15 mi minutes of meeting for questions and answers. So I'd like to introduce Darren. Darren is uh, a guy that uh, I met who started a course that we ran uh, just about 12 months ago, Darren, on um, regenerative grazing. And uh, he he was silly enough to say yes to, to um, being part of this. So welcome, Darren, and I appreciate uh, that you're being involved today. Oh, thanks for having me, and thanks for everyone to come along and try to give you a bit of knowledge of what I've learnt so far in the 12, 12 months so far and yeah hopefully you can get some get something out of it and get on the on the bandwagon so just just a bit of context um you know where where Montagita is you can see melbourne airport um and when you're out at darren's place you'll often have planes flying directly over your head um so uh you know, the average rainfall for, for that area is for, on average, who, you know, who knows what average means but and means, um, but average 45 mils during the summer months per month and then 70 mils about these three months now. Um, the average maximum temperature during the winter is nine, the average 25, so it's moderate climate and it doesn't get... You know, it has its cold spells, but it's not, not bitterly cold for long periods of time by looking at the average minimum, you know, of four degrees during those winter months. Um, so, so, Darren, what, how long have you and your family been on the property? So we um, moved into the place probably about 20, 2016, almost next month. So, um, been in there, the um, property size is about um, 700, um, 76 hectares, 200, just under 200 acres, I was say. Yeah, and, yeah. and before you, you came to the property, what <laughs> other jobs or experiences did you have running a property? Um, we had a small hobby farm up in Echuca. Oh, I, uh, my family, um, my wife um, is from Melbourne, um, born and bred, never sort of been on the farm, uh, the, the land. Um, uh, I'm an electrician by trade, was always away. Um, yeah, so we did a compromise. I moved down from Echuca. Chris and moved up from, um, from Melbourne and sort of not met in the middle, but we found a property around here. Um, I've, 
I sort of grew up on a bit of a farm when I was very young, but it was small um, up in Queensland. But we had some beef cattle, but dabbled in it really. So, yeah. And so, what was the property when you when you first looked at it to purchase it? What? How do you think it was being managed and run? Um. So I I, I still know the um, owner quite well, and Thank you. he he's basically a sheep farmer. Um, put the cattle, uh, put the sheep in for a couple of months or three months a year, let them run the whole property and take them back out again. And um, when I did see it, it was quite tall grass. Some of the grass I didn't know. So I thought, oh, that looks pretty good. Um, yeah, probably not the gra greatest of grass, but it's never really been touched. It was, um, I think they bought it in 74 and never really did just kept the maintain the fence so there's some native grasses pole grass um wallaby grass yeah bent grass yep yep and and, and so here is sort of a an aerial <coughs> shot from google um the property as you can see on the left marked out in the pink um dotted lines is is the 75 to 76 hectares and then uh, on the right is is the um, contours of the property, so you can see that it it gets a, uh, it's got quite a bit of fall on it, um, sixty meters, so that goes from four hundred meters above sea level height down to deep creek of three forty or, or below. So um, certainly not quite as steep as the as what you look at on the other side of the of Deep Creek, but it's steep enough in uh, in some places. Uh, the soil types are, are various. Um, what are the soils like, Darren? Uh, yeah, on the on the flat um, across where the four hundred is, it's um, black soil, um, and it goes down the contour to basically where you see the green and dark green, and it's um, river sandy loam so it's quite wet in the uh, winter time and really dry in the summer a bit like the black soil too um and up on the eastern so uh, western side i should say um it's it's a bit of a mixture of um black soil and um just um, chocolate so chocolate lo loamy so sort of soil so yeah and the southern side is very um clay um it's yeah, it's been washed away a lot, so. Yeah, okay. So, um, and, and the EVCs, which for, for people that don't know is the ecological vegetation class is just a way of um, what, what plants should you expect to grow there and what have grown there, depending on when you, when that class is, uh, is it pre 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 white man or 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 in the last um, few years what what you'd expect? So there's a multiple of EVCs on this property. So from from the uh, 55, which is the the plains grassy woodland, the valley grassy forest, and then the herb rich foothill forest and the stream bank um, shrublands. So there's a multiple of um, classes of, of what you would say um, plants that would grow across across the paddocks and across this um, part of the farm. So moving on to now, once you're sort of on the property and had a, what, what, what did you do when you first got there and um, onto the property? Um, so we started trying to put some sort of fencing in, um, the border fence was, was pretty good. We didn't have any internal fences. So we basically put the cattle in and trying to round them up into a, a temporary yard was almost impossible. So we sort of started slowly putting board, um, fences in and laneways and slowly, um, working in, putting more fences in and, um, mainly did it myself. I, did some, um, got some uh, Melbourne water help me with some fencing, which I'll talk about later. Um, and that was probably the first major fence was actually the Deep Creek fencing it off. Um, 
mainly because it was that in when it got dry, the cattle could get out. So that was my worst um, part of trying to lock them in. So what? What? Yeah, so we talked about cows. So what cow numbers? So you're you're a self-replacing herd of cows. Is that is that your business? Yes. So we um we bought in uh, ten uh, Angus and was it six Cherilo? So at the moment we've got um, nineteen cows, four heifers, which will be calving this year. We did have um, 19 calves this year, but we sold off 14. So one, um, five, no, four, four females we kept and one steer to fatten up again. So we probably had about um, 55 last year. We were quite a, quite a good or hard year, like, oh, the year before sort of thing, and we coped fairly well. So, yeah, so it's probably about... At the moment, uh, uh, on the uh, on the vegetation I've got is probably maximum. I probably probably um, after I've got that fourteen, I'll probably be okay for the this this summer. Um, and and so, how are you currently managing the pastures on the property? And what what did you sort of as you said you said you inherited a bit of a mixed bag of pastures. Yeah, the a um, lot of the pastures that are and the nate, oh, like the what it is there is they're not very healthy for the cows. Um, so I, I have been putting in improved pastures, but like at the moment, there's some of the paddocks is um, in December we sort of put them in. Hang on, where are we? Um, yeah, December we about thirty days in about two hectares sort of thing. We um, but they'd gone a bit too all of the pastures um, to dry. Um, but the the couple of the, well, you'll see in the later I'll show, um, I started doing the um, improving pastures, like putting the, um, yeah, down at the top, top left corner, that's um, uh, phalaris and a clover. And that was a three year project, plow it up, spray it, oats in uh, winter time I think I let it dorm um, over the summer which made it really dry um, next winter I put oats in again or autumn I put oats in again and then that that summer I put um, a leaf oil which is a rape um, a summer um, summer active legume or grass and um, and then to, this is the second season I'll get fed, fed off, which is the um, permanent pasture. So the first time I fed off was last year and it was autumn, autumn time I, I planted it. 20... So, so um, before, before we start this bit of drone footage that you've taken for me, you also had some weeds, like you've got um, needle grass on this property as well. Yes. Yeah, the um, on the on the left hand side there, um, that's majority of um, needle grass. Um, where the the dark green is is strangely enough, it's not not much at all. Um, it's just where the drier, harder country is is where the needle grass loves it because there's just no competition. Um, so I've done a couple of different options. I haven't got any photos of it, but I've sprayed it out. Um, with a, an active um, herbicide that will actually just um, activate on a needle grass. And I'll start putting seed in and over, over sowing it um, this autumn. And um, hopefully over, um, get the competition into it. So where I've strip raised this first section through this dark green, um, it's just basically because there's not much I can just literally sip graze and hopefully the some of the natural grasses start coming up with the I've got, got flaris around the property um, I've got kangaroo, um, kangaroo grass on the right there too and also the neighbors has got kangaroo grass coming through so I'm actually hand sowing some of the kangaroo grass just picking it and throwing it through the place and just you know fingers crossed I get some 
sort of growth on it. So, but, so, um, so what are we what are we looking at here? You know, what 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 did you put the drone footage as we? I'll oh, start the drone. What were we sort of pointing out? What's here to the, to the left? So, so the left there, that's um, about 2.2 2 hectares. The actual green is uh, 1.7 and then one on the right is um, 2.6 hectares. And it, it's a big slope down to that uh, valley. So that's, you, you, you can't park and can't drive up at that hill on the right there. So basically they, were, they fed in there for 20 days through that that strip of ground so you've got the one that looked like a mode strip on the left hand side and where the trees are the double trees through there there's a light green strip that's um that's 20 days worth of feed that i got out of it by strip grazing it and it's come back a lot better than the non-strip grazing um on the, on the left there, that was only 10 days I got out of it and it's still a lot of ranky grass and not wasn't eaten off and a lot of the needle grass that I wanted to get eaten down hasn't. So I have to sort of go back and try to eat it more <clears throat> and try to, you know, get, get rid of the competition. No, not, you know, so I'll probably eat it in the, sp in the springtime a little bit more again. And then you see the, the road at the top corner. So that's a, quite a steep hill down there. And they're, they're in that for um, six days. And there's still a lot of um, um, grass that they never really touched. And you've got the pole grass there, the long wispy stuff. Um, that's a native grass. That's actually um, like the, the, um, the, the getting eaten back. It's actually come back um, quite well. It's probably not the greatest of grass of the cows, but um, at least it's they actually like it when it's greener than when it's all gone rank, like you can see those tufts there. So, yeah. So, this is just a photo yeah. of, of what we've just seen. So, this is the area you strip grazed, and, and the animals aren't being so selective and they've and they've had a go at, at most of this, most of the feed that was there. Um, and as you said, you got twice as many feeds out of that area. Is that correct? Compared yeah, to, correct. Yep. to where <clears throat> they um, weren't strip grazed. And, and what what were what was the reasons for you know not strip grazing that this side and compared, you know, to the one on the left compared to the one on the right? Was it was it the fall of the land, just access to water. What 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 was the issue? Mainly, mainly just access to all the fall of the land. Just trying to strip graze. It was just not enough fences at the moment. I like that strip grazing. I'll actually have that as a dedicated paddock, and then I could probably strip graze that paddock on the on the left or the picture. Um, maybe in a couple of years' time, once I get the fences in. Um, but it, yeah, it's very hard to to um, try to run temporary fences down the hill. You're flat out walking up and down, or out trying to run um, posts and everything else up and down. So, but eventually we'll um, strip graze everything if I can. So, what? Why the why the change? You know, why the change? What? Why did you think I need to join join a course and and learn about you know this? more more regenerative grazing techniques what what made you think about doing that well i was i put fertilizer on the paddocks like the, the paddocks that i had plowed up and they you know they say oh look you know put super on this for the um it's looking a bit sick so you'd, you know i was just going with the you know what the agronomists and say oh, all right i'll put that on and you're putting money in it money in it and you put the super on you just it never kicked it never did anything you know, it was, wasn't as like lack of water and just never did anything. And I was thinking, well, if it didn't need it before, why do I need it now? You know, and what's the difference? And it was like in the back of my head, you know, it doesn't make sense. You know, why do I need to throw all this, all this money into it? And, you know, 
how many millions of years it hasn't had any fertilizer and lime and everything else and it's been all right so far so yeah then when i I don't, know, I don't know where I heard it from, but yeah, the course came up and I went, oh, I was interested. And then, yeah, I said, well, makes sense, you know? And yeah, it's um, so far so good. Like where the paddocks I have um, plowed and I haven't put any fertilizer on this year and last year. Yeah, as in there, <clears throat> that's, that's no fertilizer uh, for two years and it's kicked off like, you know that's a that's a last month that photo so it's taken off now and um, that's about a foot high already and um, there's not too much clover in that little section there but towards the dam um, it's just so much clover it's not funny and um, yeah it's going well you, you do you do see where the dung they're um, they've they're dropped and they've done their weeds and especially when they're weeds because it, it seems to grow a lot better um, and saves me fertilizing because they can do it for me. So, so this, um, how long, how long between um, <coughs> so the cows, uh, sorry, I'll ask, what, what have you learned firstly from, from the cows grazing that, that old established pastures and then coming down onto these newer, newer pastures. Yeah, well, uh, I've just put them go? back into a, a, yeah, back into a fresh pasture and they, they get, they get the squirts, which they, you know, get the runs coming through because it's quite rich for them. Um, if there's a bit of um, more vegetation, like when I fed this, this was, this was in uh, March. I fed this, and it was a lot of you can see the um, the stalky grass, and there was a lot of um, green grass, and that it, it actually never affected them as much. But if it's just all leaf, it really sets them back. Like at the moment, I'm I'm fed them, you know, like the gut, they're eating like crazy. Their tummies are so full; they don't look full. Um, the gut score doesn't look that full, as you'll find out in the course, and but. Yeah, it's going through them quite quickly, so they're starting to get quite loose and and um, so yeah, they but they do pick up a lot faster because obviously this grass has a lot more nutrients in it too, so than the the native grasses. But if you strip it and it's green pick for them, well, it is still not still good for them. So this is sort of in that same sort of area, and you. Um... It seems to be a lot of grass there. So when when did you, you know, when when was this taken? So about a month ago. That was a month ago. Um, and I'm just looking at when I was in there. And I was in, I, pull, I put them in, well, that, that's five, um, five, 5.7 hectares in that. I put them in um, the, the third, so March. They're in there for a month. Pretty much a month and month and ten days, um, and it was up to oh, about a meter high. Had a lot of a um, lot of seed, a lot of grass, and that. So they, yeah, they got put in there for forty two days. And you strip graze through that area, and that's what's grown since that time. So in in about three and a half months, that's what's grown. Yes. Down there. Yeah, and that was. That was down to two inches high. And, so. and what, so that's that's grown, you know, through the winter time. So when, yep. when people say it's too cold, um, so what? No. what's the plans? Are you back into that paddock yet or is it um, still no, not recovered? It's, no, um, it's not. Oh, I, I'd like to hold it on a lot earlier. This gets very wet, so I, I, this is sort of my summer pasture paddock. Um, it will hold the water as longer longer than most of the over the hills at the back there. That dries out a lot faster. So I try to I'll, I'll hopefully get them into like the hotter months, January, February. Um, I've got a couple of more paddocks that I'll hopefully get two feeds off of this um, summer or this spring. I'm 
just uh, where where they are at the moment I'm, I'm rushing them through just because it's getting a bit like it's like at the moment it's a little bit ranky and last year I did the bad thing I let it go too too long and it was end up being straw so I had to get rid of it because of the fire hazard but the cows suffered for it yeah and I'm still that I'm still catching up yeah so so you're not planning to be back here for another few months yet correct yeah yeah it's just way too wet down there yep so a little bit now about what what's happening so over over the over the five years you've been on the property you know what how many people run the property and you know how many people are involved in running this 75 hectares so it's mainly myself um um, carissa will come and help chase the cows up till i get some more fences in but slowly getting there um and just you know do do some of the cow work for me but mainly uh, i'm mainly running it myself um i've but before that, I was, you know, doing the ploughing, doing the fertilising, spreading, everything else. Um, so it was full on before that. Um, and now I'm probably, the tractor hasn't, what I, I think I got bogged with the tractor. Oh, not the tractor, I got bogged with the car. So that was the first time I took the car out, uh, took the tractor out in three months. So... The track just really sits there now um, for the amount of work I'm doing on the tractor and the, the diesel bill and everything else has gone down quite significantly. So just um, remind just remind us how many cows you've got on, on the property at the moment. So there is um, 23, 30, 30, um, 30 cows at the moment, 23, is it? 27 37 cows and yep. they're on the point of calving or when are they going to come no, november they'll start dropping and i've um in the six weeks i pushed them tight this year last year was a bad thing i had them too long you know hate having them in three months so six weeks so drop them and they all they're getting fatter at the moment they're putting on weight so and um yeah so they um, start dropping, and then I so, I just sold them on the nineteenth um, the calves. So just last week. Yep, just last yep. week. Right. Yeah. So um, thanks for that that question in the chat. Um, I hope that's answered that. Um, so so your inputs now and what what sort of the you know, fertilizer well, the, and, and... So the, the only inputs that I probably will do is I, I've done some spraying to get rid of the needle grass. Fencing is the probably the biggest thing. Um, um, planting trees, another number one. And I'll be doing seeding on some of the um, places that I've got the needle grass that I've, I've sprayed out. And then I'll put the some new new um, competition in for the needle grass to get rid of it, fingers crossed. Yeah. So the question here is, um, how do you check what's working and not working? So what, what are you doing to, you know, monitor and measure and make sure that you're understanding what's happening? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, good question. Um, I'm, I, I sort of walk the property a fair bit, um, just checking on, you know, the growth of it, like one of the, the paddocks that I, I sprayed, oh, not sprayed, I, I fed out um, early autumn, hasn't really grown and it's never really been done much to it. Um, it's one of my south, uh, south facing paddocks. So it probably doesn't get too much sun on the grass, but um, in, in summertime it takes off. But <sighs> I, I, so I keep monitoring, I, like I've got a spreadsheet that how long the cows have been in the paddock for and um, when it was the last in, when they were in there and how long they were in there. Um, it's a lot of, a lot of looking, you know, you, you, you'll sort of understand the, the ground a lot better. Like, you know, every paddock's a little bit different in my place, you know, cause it's 
one is on top of the the flat and the next one it's on top down the valley and the ground is um completely different and you know you'll get some with the needle grasses and um some type of grass is good and then the other places you know it's you've got trouble with um all the the bad grasses that you want to get rid of sort of thing and, or, so yeah so know, it's quite through. quite a rocky you could see in different parts of those it's quite rocky and, and steep in some parts got a question here it says what what was the spray used for needle grass um it was um i said it before now i can't think of it now. uh it's a it's a special grass uh, special and i have to look it up i can't think of it off off my head yeah, that's um, okay. Um, yeah. Uh, another question here is, do you have any insights on bent grass management without spraying it out? So how have you managed some of the bent grass on your property? Lucky, oh, I've got, I've, I've definitely got it. I, I'll actually um, try to eat it hard. It, it's just competition. If you eat it down and, and, try to get as low as possible and if you can put some other seed into it and try to give it some competition you'll actually move it on um one thing i haven't i'm not really worrying about too much in the um, bent grasses the needle grass is my more concern um but yeah if you can well i think it's the um grazing is, is probably the biggest thing I, I can think of try you know try to eat it down get it down and um so the other grasses can have a have a go <clears throat> yeah that's that's basically pretty right mary thanks for your question and and the other method some people have used without spraying it has been um burning um so that's uh where they've been able to burn it and then um and then put put something else in that's going to more uh more targeted species that you want and then manage the property for that target species that you'd like rather than managing it for the species that you don't want. So that's that's really the trick um, and getting enough enough grazing pressure to, to so that they're not selectively grazing. So you, you, you've sort of touched on uh, some of the steeper parts of the property and and also what you what are you doing with the as other sort of areas so you've put in some tree plantations you mentioned that you'd fenced off with the support of melbourne water some of the the riparian zones yeah yeah um i don't know if it, which is the next slide is that one with the um yeah, uh, uh, yeah so there you've got the, um, the picture there you've got the where the um the fescue is in the top corners and where the cursor is um, all the little brown dots, all the grey, that's all trees I planted um, this this autumn. Uh, there's 400, 450 trees just in there um, from Melbourne Water. Um, they put, help um, um, fund that for me. And as you go over that, where you see the, the, the rocks along, there's a fence line that they've given me funding to put the fence in. Um, so that's that all that crappy rocky outcrop with a quite um, hilly country <clears throat> they've given me um, fencing um, uh, to take all that out so the the, the, um, the cows don't trot it and uh, wear it out um, and like in five years time you can basically once the trees get up and then the trees can go sit in there and everything else I can let them back in and um, they can, you know, have a bit more feed and then I can actually start down the bottom there. I'd, I'd, I'd probably start trying to get rid of the uh, needle grass there and, and start strip grazing it again and try to get some decent grass in there. And then I've got a fence I can um, actually work strip grazing from the, 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 the light green back to where that, the, the cursor is. I can strip graze through there because at the moment I can't, I've got, I don't know, nearly 30 hectares that it's one big paddock, like there's 300, 400 metres between fences. So I can't strip it. I let them in there and they just wander around and, you know, you, you just can't get rid of the, the grass you want. 
So that was uh, where you, where where you're fortunate enough, where farmers are fortunate enough to be in Melbourne Water Catchment and in their targeted um, areas, like like Darren is, you can you can access some grants that know pay for materials is it Darren for fencing and, and they'll pay for the trees but you have to plant them and put the fence up is that how this works yeah. on this particular one which is the yes yeah, they'll give handy fencing yeah they'll, they'll give you funding for the stakes um, tree guards trees and you'll um, you have to pay for the the planting um, the fencing, they'll give you so much, depending on how far away from the river it is and everything else, is, um, how much per metre of fencing they'll give you. And um, I'm fortunate I can do all the fencing myself, so I, um, it's a lot cheaper for me. But look, it, it's it's better than paying for 100% of it than, than, than um, you know, even if you pay half, half the fence, then 100%, it's better in your, your pocket than... So yeah, so and, and it and helped. It helps. It helps me out a lot with strip grazing as well, a lot down the track. Yeah. So, <coughs> so question here is that what trees are you planting in these plantations? I assume that that's just selected by Melbourne Water, which trees they are, and they'll be based on that EVC that I spoke about earlier. Is that your understanding? Correct. Yeah. Yes, correct. Yeah, it's all all native trees, all for the area. A lot of the trees I've actually got on the property. Um, Malalukas and um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of a lot of them already there, um, and you know this my property is very limited of trees. I have probably got a couple of dozen of decent gums, like you can see in the big gum trees. I haven't got many at all, but yeah. Um, so yeah, so and, and then you. Just, so the thing is that yeah, so this is demonstrating that Melbourne Water don't just fence along creeks. They they will do what's called land class fencing on, on certain areas because this is seen as a high erosion area or, or, or something along those lines. So that's that's why they've uh, supported it. Now, it's not at the same level of support that uh, a long deep creek here would, would receive, but it is, as Darren's talked about, it, it does help a lot um, if, you, if you use it to benefit you know, as Darren said, he's yeah. now able to, if the fence happens along there, to to um, to be now strip graze. So, Darren, I didn't notice it until you pointed it out. What's what's this little thing over here? So that's that's oh, um, dung beetle um, nursery that I've just started. Um, uh, must be about a month. Oh, actually, no, it'd be two months ago, just before my shoulder operation. Um, so yeah, they, uh, there's an um, introduced species that's been in Australia for a fair while and um, all been studied all over, but there's a lack of it around in this area. So I was lucky enough to be picked to, on our property to put them in. So I've got about a hundred dung beetles, male, female, um, and come next autumn, I'll catch some of them and actually put them out. So I, every couple of days I'll go down and just check on them see how they're feeding and I feed them this was um dung there's a white bucket sort of next door I pick it up before it gets fully empty and leave it there for a few days so the, the advantage of this one instead of buying them in um a set of like you know 3,000 and you just put them on the property and fingers crossed and hope for the best they survive and then you you could have a real wet two weeks and they all die because they all get drowned you've got um, advantage of them, you grow them on your property, you only get a hundred by next year. I should have about a thousand. The year after, they'll probably triple and prop. You know, I think they have nearly 20 per digging. So, you know, I should have like three or four thousand of them, and I can keep um, putting them out around the, the you know, with the cows and hopefully make, make, um, dig plenty of holes for me and air out the soil and, you know improve the pastures that way as well and um, I've noticed since I've got the dung beetles I've, I've been noticing the dung beetles there's you know three different types I've seen so far um, one native one and um, two introduced ones so I have already got them on, proper, on the property um, 
two of them are di digging and one's non-digging. So I'd, then this one's a different one again. So fingers crossed this one's dig down about 20 centimetres or so. So that should be a lot better. And that's a, um, um, Port Phillip and Western Port CMA are, are supporting that project at the moment. So that's, uh, I was unaware that Darren had that little project going on. So um, be interested to see how, how those breeding up those dung beetles and, and the dung beetles that you've got, uh, those newer ones, what they're up to. So, um, yeah. and when, when they are active. Um, yeah, uh, they, these ones are active in the um, um, springtime. So uh, there's a very low, low, low active uh, rating dung beetles in spring. So the, they're trying to push the introducing of this the spring. So the winter, they're quite active at the moment. Um, yesterday, they were running around everywhere. And um, yeah, into the springtime. And then, then you've got the summer active ones coming in. But, so yeah. So, um, and also Melbourne Water will give you um, funding for troughs and piping. Um, I've got a lot, of, um, a lot of troughs on the property that they've given me and you see in the picture. The, um, the blue line, um, the, the dark, well, the light blue line. Yeah, the light, the light, light blue line, that's the, it's um, in this funding that I've got to put in. And the dark blue line, which is joined there, that's already existing. They funded that for me as well. Um, so I've got to pump down the deep creek that goes up to the, uh, right up to the top of, top far, yeah, that dark blue line goes all the way up to the top left corner. Um, uh, that's one tank which does the, the property and then also it goes to the other southern corner there Jason near the big shed yeah there's a tank up there so that will do the um, southern side of the property so it's all gravity fed and it pumps one way and then gravity feds back so I don't need to have a pump and that's all off solar as well um, and Deep Creek with that where the cursor is at the moment that green section is Melbourne water put all that to river frontage. So I've got a creek, a oh, little creek running through the property. So I've, that's all. And there's, I mean, in that section there, there's uh, 250 trees last year and another 400 trees this year got put in. And, um, and also the deep creek uh, river frontage on the black line, yeah, that, that one was my first one, which, what did he put in? Um, that was 2016 that got put in. That's nearly, yeah, 900 metres got put in there, which cut all of Deep Creek off to. So because I cut all of Deep Creek off, I didn't have any external water supply. So that's why they gave me the um, pumping. And Not so, the pump, but the, the, the water. And yeah, troughs. So, so with that area down there, so it's been five years, um, do, you, do you great crush graze any of that area or is it locked up yep. that you shall never see use that land again? How, how no, no, they, 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 went, they were in there, um, they just came out of there three days ago. So I, I try to strip graze a bit of it, but it's quite rough and hard. Um, but, yeah, they, I've got a, a, tr a trough down there, so they sort of, Go to the trough more than go into the creek, but um, yeah, I, I tried it tw uh, a quick one in summertime, which didn't really work, and I and I did it one this time, which will get the winter grasses and the needle grasses, and not the um, kangaroo grass. So I was, I, I'm doing it a bit different, trying to get the native grasses what I want, and um, yeah, more more uh, more competition for the for the native grasses to get, get rid of the needle. So. Yeah, so, so grazing at different times of year is, is important to sort of, sort of get your target species up and going and, and the, the non-target ones to be competed for. So apart from sort of those plans where you've got more, more um, fencing, um, more trough work, what, what other future plans um, have you got yeah. the property? Well, um, more more trees um, to give it more shelter belts. Um, it's very open here, so you, you, the poor cows are out in the open a lot. Um, 
yeah, just trying to get more shallow bowels and the, obviously the fencing, the smaller paddocks or paddocks that I can strip raise more manageable and be a work it myself a lot easier. Like I don't, if I can get the cows going into laneways and they walk back to themselves and I can go, um, you know, check on them and put them in the yards myself. And, you know, and since I've been strip grazing, the cows are a lot tamer. They, you know, you can walk right up to them and almost pat them. You know, they sort of look at you and go, well, what are you doing here? You know, go away. Um, and then I can actually call them, you know, just go up there and go to the, go to the gate and like, come on. And they go, oh, we're going to another paddock. And they're all, all off the rush that before you'd run around behind them and yell and curse and swear at them and they will look at you and run, run behind you. So. So, 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 you, so you mentioned that you had um, a shoulder, Rico. What, what, what impact did that have on moving fences and well it was just one big paddock um so i'm only just starting to do strip strip grazing again now um yeah for the se seven weeks that I, I sort of really couldn't do too much at all and i, I sort of didn't want to overstress it so yeah i basically just put them in a paddock and uh, a little little electric fence and put them in one paddock um, it was one of the, the, the pictures where the, the, um, the trees were. I just left them in there. Then I just moved them in another big paddock and then I just moved them in another big paddock. And they just sort of, I sort of set them up before I had me up and then just had to run the, the tape out. And yeah, they, you know, they had a couple of hectares just to run around and eat all the good stuff out and leave all the stuff that I don't, I don't want to, don't want them to grow, but they do as they do. And um, yeah, so, yeah, so, it's, so it's important to always be mindful that you know there is a perfect way to do things, but sometimes life gets in the way. And you know, in, in Darren's case, um, you know, he's had a sh shoulder rico and therefore couldn't strip graze and do things perfectly. Um, but as and I think Darren, you'd say that well, it was a good thing to learn that the strip grazing was working because you got a feedback straight away to say, well, that, yep, the animals aren't eating the, the bits that I want them to eat. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You know, the, you see that like all the, the needle grass and the power grass is um, not lit, knocked off the top and the needle grass is sort of ranky. And, and, and then you've got the, um, a bit of phalaris and a bit of um, kangaroo grass and it's down to the ground. So what can you do? You know, you can't make a meat it other than, you know, stripping it. So yeah, it's, you definitely notice the, you know, what they do and what they don't do. If you let them choose, it was like us, you know, we're going to eat carrots all day or eat um, chocolate, chocolate cake. So any other sort of future things that, um, you know, other future plans and. Oh, uh, look, uh, um, trying to, Oh, it's it's a hard one. Um, it's mainly mainly just less input um, to get better, you know, more output. Like, is in, you know, instead of putting a heck of a lot of money into the the cows and and like doing um, all the overheads, if I don't have to put all the overheads and you don't technically I don't have to have as many cows because I'm getting more money for less cows but more profit anyway. So because it's it's a working farm. It's not a hobby farm, but you know, small small properties can be the same thing as well. You know. So uh, most some of you have been putting in information using the Zoom feature of the chat. Um, if you know how to put your hand up using the that to uh, to ask a question, if you're not that okay with typing, please uh, do that now as well. Um, and I'll, I'll just go back through a couple of the questions that we didn't touch on, as I know we were, were getting towards the end. Um, one of the questions was, can we have a session at Darren's farm to learn up the, the dung beetle uh, uh, nursery? Uh, ideally, the whole plan was that we would be there in 10 days time on Friday, the 3rd of uh, September. I can probably fairly confidently say that we won't be meeting. Um, yes, so we won't be. We not confidently. We won't be meeting on Darren's farm. That was always part of this process: is to go and actually see whether Darren was 
telling Porky Pies or not, so we could actually go and see him and see the farm. Um, so yeah, the idea would be that we would like to do that um, and and see see the nursery. Um, so we'll be postponing it at this stage and hopefully in the near future we'll, we'll be able to and I'll certainly let all of you that have been uh, registered for this uh, webinar uh, when we do go and have a look at the place. Um, uh, I, 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 there, the other question here is from Sam, who I know is Narelle, about replacing har harrowing. Don't don't get me started on harrowing right now. Those that know me um, know that uh, the best the best thing for harrows is to hang them up in a tree and hang other things from them. Um, no, it's good for the cows to scratch the backs on. Yeah, yeah, that that yeah. Okay, so don't get me started on harrowing, Narelle. I'll let you off this time. Um, <laughs> but if you ask me again, you'll get the full. It, it, it is it is my little pet thing that people will know me for. Um, another question, what water and trough solutions um, are you looking at when strip grazing? Are you sort of looking at implementing just that, those permanent fit troughs or are you looking at more movable ones? I've got, um, yes, I've got, I've got both. I'll, I'll have permanent ones in, in the paddocks, which is sort of my tapping points. And then I run off a hundred meter inch pipe off the permanent one to a little 200 liter um, tank or a little trough. And then I'll move that around. I've sort of, it's all in the, the pipeline. I've got everything there. I just got to build it. So, um, and put more pipes in too. And so yeah, it's, it's getting there <laughs> slowly. And have a shoulder that can do it. Um, yeah, that's that too. And build um, a house. Question here. How, how do you decide when to put the stock on and remove them from the strip? Is this based on time or grass length? Um, it's well it's a bit of both it's a, it depends on when the, what the paddocks are like if it's a really wet paddock i try not to put them in like we're at the moment i'm really rushing them over um but it is very wet like they i don't want them to bog it up and then i'll lose the summer grass but um but it is getting long so the you'll go in the course but you know the the, the bottom leaves are starting to die off which is technically needs to be eaten um otherwise your grass won't sort of grow as, as good as it gets a bit rank so then they don't eat it anyway so you go backwards anyway but it's 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 both actually um sometimes you just can't get them in because it's too wet and sometimes it's you just got to get them in because it's going to get too old so and, and darren did mention that he is quite often looking at at the dung quality so that's a good sign of what um but also uh, on their gut fill. So actually looking at the animal and looking at the animal's behavior. So Darren um, doing that and looking at that. Um, uh, Viviana's uh, put in, uh, if you're in the Melbourne water area and want to apply for some funding um, as Darren has done, there's a link in there for those of you in that catchment, if you would like, um, to apply for some funding or at least um you know you'll you could also um i can also send out viviana's uh email address and contact details if you would like if that's okay with you viviana to do that um next question is how do you set up your strip grazing fences are they permanent and how wide are the strips um not permanent at the moment. I'll, I, 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 don't, I might put some permanent later on, but not, not at the moment. They're, they're all just the, um, I call them pigtails. They're just a push in pigtail while the ground's soft. And then you go back to steel pickets later on. Um, I just got the, the, um, what the three in one pen reel. I just got them online actually on eBay and the small electric fence wire. It's a cheaper setup than buying the, you know, the Gallagher and everything else sort of systems that get a bit dear, but 
like if you know you're going to use them all the time well you go get buy the really good stuff um i didn't know i was going to use it as much i actually bought them mainly to get the cows in first and now i'm using them all the time so i'll probably end up buying better wire but the the reels are quite good um and it depends on the grass how high it is um the grass at the moment where they are is it's probably a foot high but i don't want them to eat them f- um, much so i'm still i'm a bit shocked on how fast they're going through but then i think because it's so green it's starting to go through them a bit quicker so they they're not filling up as much as i think it i think they are but i'm moving them a lot more like the paddock where they were um this time last year they, they would have been still in the start start of the paddock that, that I was, and now I've, I've moved them three times as much already, um, mainly because it's too gr- the green green grass. And um, yeah. So with only a, a few minutes to go, um, I've just got one last question here. Uh, do you? Uh, and also, there's an email address there to contact Juliana. Uh, do you have to buy in any feed for the cattle? No, never have. Um, it's one thing that I always thought that's a, a big waste of money. If you can, if you can grow your own grass, why, why buy it in? If you, if you've, obviously, if you, if you're buying um, hay in and everything else, you're overstocked. Yeah. So, so and um, do drenches impact on dung beetle survival well we know certain ones do and certain drenches yes. do um there are others that claim that they don't so um check the labels um and whether you actually need to drench your animals is the other the other part so thanks yeah. for all of those questions um just just while the, i've still got this up you know the, the next two weeks we've got uh, further webinars coming up um, for those of you who've got horses, uh, we will have a webinar with um, Stuart Meyer, um, well-known um, person with the horse industry on, on his subject, the other 23 hours. We'll have Graham uh, Lorimer talking about identifying pasture grasses, and you'll see down further, he will come and do a field day um, in, in three of the, the shires. Uh, hopefully in late November. So the webinar will be in uh, late October and the identifying field days will be in late November. Uh, we also got holistic practitioner, Brian Welberg, who's going to do a presentation for us in mid October. And then in late, um, in early December, we'll hopefully have someone from the Bureau of Meteorology talking about the climate and climate drivers. We've also got our um, grazing course um, coming up. So please have a look at the the website at the Shires and fill in the expression of interest form. If you're interested in joining the course with myself and Sam White um, delivering that course this year. Um, If you're in in the three Shires of the City of Greater Bendigo, Hepburn Shire Council, and Macedon Rangers Shire Council, again, fill out the expression of interest form on the websites if you're interested in, in a property visit and where I can come out and talk to you about some of the things that Darren's implementing um, and some of the things uh, that we uh, about water and moving stock. And then hopefully coming up in 2022, we'll have uh, some more field days. Hopefully we'll be able to do those. Um, And if you haven't signed up to the newsletter, again, go to the Masson Rangers Shire Council website, type in healthy landscapes, and you'll um, you'll see there a place where you can sign up for the newsletter. Um, A massive thank you to Darren for being involved and a massive thank you to all of you that have joined in today. and made it worthwhile for us to run these events. Uh, Hopefully um, that um, this uh, recording will will, um, 